And I think uh, if if it's slowed down, I think we can get started. I'll yep, let Ryan ahead, just record. All right, great. Okay, welcome to the ESC office hours for March 12th, 2024. Like I said, you are in the right place if, uh, if you're looking for the ESCA team. Um, and we'll just get right into, we have quite a few announcements today, so I'll just get us started here. Um, all right, Jeff? The, yeah, the first thing we wanted to share with you all is FY25 preliminary allocations. Estimates are delayed. We typically have them out in March, but we have not received figures from the U.S. Department of Education, so we can't do the calculation process, start the calculation process yet. Um, we are waiting for the labor, health, and human services and education-related appropriations bill to be passed. So stay on top of the news. I'm trying to track it as well, um, and we'll let you know when we have more information. We also wanted to remind folks that the Title IA Summer Reallocated application is live on the website. We have a training that we gave last week or the week before that is on our resources page on the website. It is due Friday, March 29th at 5 p.m. Um, there's also some takeaway uh, best practices, resources online, as well as last year's training for those interested. Our next announcement is the tidings amendment. Um, we are going to be putting in another request to extend the FY23 ESEA funds and to allow the state to give Title I carryover waivers, regardless of the three-year minimum rule. Um, we're about to put that out for public comment through a priority notice in the DOE newsroom. So please be on the lookout for that. We're hoping it'll be released by the end of this week where we think your feedback will be really important in order for the USD DOE to um, potentially give us this waiver. So definitely as many of you who, who feel like this would be helpful for your SAU, please um, share why that would be. Okay. Another training that we hosted uh, a few weeks back was the equitable services for non-public schools training, which was, I know, a pretty big request from SAUs, looking for more updated resources, and again, um, another sort of holistic overview of all that goes into equitable services. The training was recorded, and the recording itself is mandatory for the non-public school leaders to watch in order to receive equitable services in FY25. So um, you'll see in a moment, we linked the video on the actual new form that we would like uh, coordinators to use with their non-public partners. Um, the screenshot that you're seeing there is just where a lot of these new resources that we've updated, including the forms um, are online. We will also put those forms in the Grants for Me application in 2025, similarly to how we had done before. But if you want to download it right from there, if you want to peruse the other resources we have, I know we've added sample email templates, as well as a template to guide the actual consultation process to make sure you um, address all requirements and parts. So take a moment, especially for those obviously that work with non-public schools, we're hoping that this training that these updated resources will help with that process because we know it's been um, there's been challenging points um, in the past. So please make sure that you're aware of this and that when you're communicating with your non-public SAUs, they are aware that this year there is a training and new forms to use. Um, and we just wanted to exactly like I just mentioned, show you that new form. Um, it will be uploaded, as I mentioned, and then those other resources are there where I showed you that screenshot. And we just wanted to show you the arrows of the new things. You'll see that right under sort of, I know it's small, but the non-public school official information, that first arrow, that is pointing to the assurance that they'll have to check off. And it has that link now. Um, the new form has the link online um, that'll go right to the YouTube page with the actual training. I will say that if it's helpful for folks, I appreciate this. There are also just the PDF 
slides of the entire training. And those exist uh, where I showed you that screenshot. It's in that list of all those resources. So that might be helpful too, uh, if folks want to have like PDF slides of all of the information. All right. And speaking of equitable services, this is the time of year every year where we reach out to our non-public colleagues and ask them for a little bit of data to help determine those equitable service percentages and equitable service amounts for Title I especially. Uh, so the survey is now open. You'll see that in the chat here in a moment. We did share it during our training, but we're asking, you know, if all of you folks can also help send it to your colleagues that you know seek equitable services, that would be helpful. Uh, we're putting it out in a priority notice, but we know not everyone updates their email address with the DOE as often as maybe they should. So always good to kind of have that second point of contact to remind folks that we do need that data uh, for titles two, three, and four. It's just their October one counts along with uh, some basic contact information. And then for title one, it's a little bit more in the weeds with some uh, student poverty data to determine those equitable service amounts. Uh, all the directions, though, are going to be linked in that priority notice, and they should be able to get them right by going to the survey as well. And speaking of surveys, uh, every year we at the department reserve a portion of Title II and Title IV funding for what we call state activities to provide training and technical assistance uh, to folks out in the field. And it is one of our statutory obligations to hear from stakeholders like all of you about what needs you're seeing in our schools to help guide how we spend those funds. So we have put out a brief survey about state activities and the needs you're seeing in our schools. We'd love it if you could take some time and fill out that survey. You're welcome to share it with any of your colleagues, parents, any other stakeholder groups you have. Uh, really, the more the merrier, the more data we get, the better we can kind of narrow down what the needs are in main schools and help to meet those needs with our set aside of Title II and four funds. Shifting gears a little bit, uh, our FY24 monitoring cohort soldiers on. We start the spring window here on April 1st. You should see that opening uh, in grants for me in the next couple of weeks, certainly before the first. None of our items have changed for those of you who participated in the pilot last spring. We did make one slight adjustment. Item A8, it's a Title III item, went from being just for the folks who are category, categorized as needing a high level of support to also being for the folks with a medium level of support. So all of the fact sheets for all of the items that you'll need are already posted to our website. Um, and I think we also had our initial training video on how the monitoring instrument worked was based on that spring monitoring cohort. So you can go in and check that out as well. Is Monique here? I think she might have been joining us later. So I'll just read the slide here. Um, uh, information related to the Maine's model of school support remains unavailable until the main DOE receives that final amendment approval. So again, just um, wanting, I think Monique wants to make sure you guys know that we're hurry up and wait sort of um, status. Um, okay, and wonderful Tyra, fiscal corner. Uh, good morning, everyone. You can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you have a question for the federal fiscal team? You can get your answers at the next Federal Fiscal Office Hour, which happens the last Thursday of every month from 10 to 11. And you need to pre-register um, on our uh, events calendar, DOE events calendar, which I have linked here in the slide. We're gonna go over some invoicing, uh, particularly what needs to happen when you're splitting invoicing between two grant years. All of the following must be true. Expenses of, are allocable to both grant year applications. Expenses fall within the period of performance for both grant years. And trial balances need to be noted of the intention to split the request. Keep in mind, if you are splitting salaries and benefits, they need... Somebody's saying they can't hear me. We can. Zach, can you hear her now? We, we could hear you, Tyra, so. Okay. Um, Soldier so on. When, all right. When you're splitting salaries and benefits between two grant years, um, you must do it proportionately. So meaning salaries 
in say FY23 need to have the associated benefits with those salaries in FY23. And then the same for FY24, if you were splitting them that way. So some fiscal definitions that we're gonna go over today. Obligations, I feel like we do go over this frequently. The obligation date is the earliest date on any document that pertains to the service or commodity that is going to be acquired. And also when subgrantees may begin to obligate funds. That means the SAUs. Um, so it's the later of the following two dates, the date that the state may begin to obligate funds or the date that the applicant submits its application to the state in substantially approvable form. Next slide. Period of performance, why is that important? Because the date, the obligation date, the work and the payment for these expenses need to fall within the period of performance. I have two screenshots here, both from grants for me. One is the grant award notification, and it says the period of performance is 7 1 to 9 30. That is the period of performance for the state. Um, your period of performance begins with your substantially approvable date, which you can find on the project summary um, page on the invoicing side. So we always say that costs, allowable costs need to be reasonable, necessary, and allocable. And we always give a broad definition, such as a cost is reasonable if in its nature and amount, it does not exceed that which would be incurred by a prudent person. Well, your definition of a prudent person and mine may be two different things, right? So I have um, provided additional guidance that comes right out of Edgar uh, for reasonable. And um, so whether the cost uh, is of a type generally recognized as ordinary and necessary for the operation of the non-federal entity or the proper and efficient performance of the federal award. And the next one is key. It must ha um, have factors such as sound business practices, arm length bargaining, federal, state, local, tribal, and other laws and regulations and terms and conditions of the federal award. Allocable costs. I've also linked here the um, CFR for allocable costs. A cost is allocable to a particular federal award or other cost objective if the goods and services involved are chargeable or assignable to that federal award. When it's saying assignable, we should see some sort of uh, information in your application so that we know that that cost is assignable to one of your um, high need areas. Reimbursement. Reimbursement is money paid as repayment for a business expense. A federal award is considered expensed when the applicate when the activity related to the federal award occurs. And that is defined in 200.502. Remember, the, the obligation date, the work, and the payment for that work all needs to happen within the period of performance of a grant. And they are not reimbursable until they have occurred and the payment has been made. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm just gonna close this out with a few general reminders today. Uh, first of which is um, just a uh, kind of a friendly reminder or perhaps announcement for some folks here. Um, we have started instituting a process whereby we 
uh, as an ESEA team place temporary holds on access to ESEA funds. Uh, if there's a situation where adequate and timely progress is not being made on ESEA work, um, that could involve things like uh, grant applications, performance reports, and or uh, monitoring from one of our various collection windows. Um, if you are in a situation where you have a temporary hold placed on your funds, you will be notified through grants for me by your ESEA regional program manager. Um, and then they will likely uh, shortly thereafter follow up with you in a more targeted way uh, in an effort to try and um, get whatever is um, resulting in the hold on your funds resolved. Because uh, ultimately we wanna make sure that uh, this is kind of like a last resort solution and that we're not um, holding up access to funding for any prolonged period of time. I uh, also wanted to draw everyone's attention to the fact that we do have some uh, grants that are going to be expiring later this year. Um, particularly of note for folks here, um, we want to be sure that folks are working to draw down FY22 ESEA funds. Um, those funds are currently under a tidings amendment waiver, meaning that uh, September 30th of this year is kind of the be all end all date for those funds. Uh, they will no longer be available after that time. Um, as of this point in time, FY23 funds also fall into that same scenario. Um, you know, while we are in the process now of pursuing a tidings amendment waiver for FY23, which would extend those funds for another 12 months, um, there's no guarantee that we'll actually get that from the federal government. Um, so to the extent that you can, I would be meeting with your um, business office colleagues and really taking a hard look at where you're at with your ESEA funds for 23 and uh, 22 um, and seeing what sorts of ways you might be able to um, draw those down in a uh, reasonable way. Uh, the department also has a uh, professional development calendar uh, that we maintain that has plenty of opportunities for all sorts of um, professional development from not just the EACA team, but um, other um, agencies or, or other organizations within the department. Um, if you folks are in need of professional learning of any kind, I uh, strongly recommend that you uh, go here as kind of a first resource and, and search through what's going to be available over the coming weeks and coming months, um, because for the most part, anything in that calendar is available to you free of charge. Um, again, for those who may be newer to their roles, just wanted to, to indicate here um, that we as a state agency do have a uh, kind of share leadership model for our ESEA funds, where we have different um, regional program managers who uh, basically serve as your uh, point of contact for ESEA programming. Um, and we, we basically take the state and divide it up by superintendent region. Uh, so if you're ever curious as to who uh, to reach out to at the department with your ESEA questions, um, just take a look here, determine which superintendent region your district falls within, um, and then that's the person that you would reach out to on our team. And then lastly, we just want to encourage everyone to stay connected to the department in general. Um, we put out all sorts of information through a number of different mediums, um, many of which can be gleaned from this slide here. Um, if you're interested in um, accessing the, the main DOE newsletter or anything like that, I um, strongly recommend that you um, kind of look at these various channels here and uh, follow, subscribe, what have you.